Well, continuing on with our series, Sermon on the Mount, picture of a Christian. The, these things we're going to be reading today are a picture of a Christian, a portrait of a Christian. I pray that you are a Christian. I pray that those listening online, that you are a Christian. You've given your life to Jesus Christ. If not, today's the day. Just surrender your heart to Him and begin a relationship with Jesus and watch these traits grow in your everyday life. So I have somebody who's going to come up and read right now. Miss Lydia is going to come. And this uh, sermon is entitled, Do Not Worry, from Matthew 6, 25 through 34. And uh, reading from the New International Version. There you go. Lydia, welcome. Good to have you here. And here. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds in the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are they? Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about your clothes? See how the lilies in the fields grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Do not worry, say, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek his kingdom first, and his righteousness, and these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen. Thank you. Good job, Lydia. May God add blessing to the reading and doing of his holy will today. This is a, uh, this is a tough lesson for us. It sounds wonderful. It sounds nice. But it's a tough lesson to live day after day after day. We're going to kind of dig into this. Why, why do people worry? Why do people worry? Why do I worry? Well, Jesus kind of talked about three things we worry a lot about. What we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, and what we're going to wear. <laughs> we worry about a lot of things, material things. Now, there is a difference. There is a difference. In the Bible, Paul had concern for the churches. Paul had concern. Jesus had concern. Jesus wrestled all night in prayer about the cross. There, there is a concern. There is a pressure, a weight that we can have on us that's not worry. So don't be hard on yourself this morning, but just think through the issues. There is a difference between concern and godless worry. There's a big difference. So it's okay to be concerned about your health. It's okay to be concerned about your children and making it to school on time. And, you know, a little bit of concern is good. It gets you to work every day. <laughs> you don't want to be fired. So you have some concern to keep your job. But there, there is a thing called godless worry, which is where we just kind of don't even imagine God is even around. Now, we're going to talk about some delicate things here, and I don't claim to know everything about this. Anxiety is so complex. There is a complexity to anxiety, but Jesus talks right to the heart of it here. Right to the. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a psychiatrist. I am a pastor, and I'm going to... I'm going to give you the Word of God today, and we're going to sort through this together and ask God to help us not to be anxious. That's what he says. Do not be anxious for anything. That's what he says. <laughs> right here, this is out of the Amplified Version. Therefore, I tell you, stop being perpetually uneasy, Jesus says. That means anxious and worried about your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink or about your body, what you should put on. Is not life greater than food and the body far more excellent than clothing? I love that peaceful scene behind there, just a lake, just to be at peace with God. And there's something about looking at nature, we're going to see that here, that helps us to relax in Him. There's a, there's a book by, uh, called Dark Night of the Soul, uh, written about five, 500 years ago. St. John of the Cross wrote it, and he talked about a, a dark night of the soul that we can have. And he was a Christian. He was a follower of Christ, but he had this dark night of the soul that lasted for years. And you say, what is that dark night of the soul? It was this. The dark night of the soul is a period of utter spiritual desolation, disconnection, and emptiness in which one feels totally separated from the divine. Those who experience the dark night feel completely lost, 
hopeless, and consumed with melancholy. This was a Christian, godly man who experienced a drought in his life spiritually for years. And he couldn't get through to God, he felt like. He was fasting, he was praying, he was reading scripture, he was devoting himself to God, and he felt like there was this brass above him and his prayers could not get through. And there can come over us those moods. Now, that's not anxiety. That is just a dark night of the soul. We can have those. That's not sin. You're doing what you're supposed to do. You're living for God. You're going through your everyday life, and there are times you feel like you're disconnected from God. It doesn't mean you're disconnected from God, but it's a strong feeling. It's a strong emotion. And this St. John experienced that in his life. And I think sometimes we pray and pray and pray, God, take this away. But, you know, 2 Corinthians 12, 7, Paul, therefore, he said this, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. God, take away the dark night of the soul. God, take that away from me. Take away this depression that I'm in. And sometimes God says, no, my grace is sufficient for you. That no matter what your mood, you continue to serve God. No matter how you're feeling, you just continue to serve God. You just kind of, you just grind it out. You say, Lord, I'm serving you. I don't feel anything. Sometimes you have to do that in marriage. Sometimes you have to do that with your job. It doesn't matter how you feel. You keep on following after Christ. Lord, I trust you. If you don't answer my prayer the way that I want you to, I'm still going to serve you. <laughs> David prayed this. I think David struggled with depression. He said, he said this. He's talking to himself. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. You have to talk to your soul. That's what David does right here. Soul, what are you doing? Your soul is your mind, your emotion, and your will. What, what's going on? Oh, soul? No, we're going to focus on God. You feel like schizophrenic? Well, David probably did too. Sometimes we have to just kind of talk to ourselves and say, God, what's going on in my soul? And we direct our mind to him and we direct our mind to scriptures even when we don't feel like it and we follow after him. Where does worry originate? Now we're talking about worry, not concern, not, not just legitimate concern. We're talking about worry, godless worry. Where does that originate? We're going to be biblical, so we're going to look at this. Uh, Ephesians, Paul says in Ephesians 6.12, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. I think Satan wants us to worry. Don't you? I think Satan wants us, he wants me to worry. Because when I'm worrying, I'm not focusing on Christ. Now, I can have concern and focus on Christ, but when I get to worrying, and I do sometimes, I'm just going to confess that sometimes I worry about things in the middle of the night that I can't make one change on. And it takes me a while to get, I'm, I'm kind of asleep, kind of waking up, and I'm thinking about these things, and then, and then I have to consciously turn my mind to God, and I don't feel like it. I'm tired, and I'm thinking, I want to go to sleep. Why do I keep thinking about this? And it's worry. And now, Lord, help me. And sometimes I don't feel like the Lord helps me. That's my feeling. He helps me, but my feeling is, God, where are you? And I struggle in the middle of the night, and I feel so weak, and I feel like Satan is battling me in the middle of the night over something that I'm worried about, and I'm trying to take it to God, and I feel like I'm weak. I feel like I'm trying to punch, and I don't have any strength. But we still just keep going to God. Lord, I'm limited in my strength. I've just said, God, I can't get this out of my mind. You're going to have to help me. You just got to confess it to God. I'm just being real with you. We've got to just practice this thing called Christianity, don't we? Help us, Lord. Help us. Luke 13, you remember the story? Jesus is there, and there's a woman who's bent over for 18 years. And, and let's look at just a few of these scriptures here that, that Jesus says to this lady in Luke 13. And a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit. That's interesting. She'd been crippled by a spirit for 18 years, she was bent over and could not straighten up at all. Then Jesus put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Huh. Here's the next verse. Then Jesus is talking to them, and they're all mad at him for doing a, a miracle on, on Saturday, the Sabbath. And he says, Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? I didn't say that. Jesus said that. 
I'm not saying that all mental disorders are from Satan. I'm not saying that all sickness is from Satan. I'm not saying that at all, but I'm saying sometimes it is from Satan. Jesus recognized, Jesus didn't say, we need to get you to a doctor. We need to get you to, and there's a place for a doctor. I think God gave us doctors. When I have a headache, I take aspirin. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. And I think there are things that God gives us the miracle of medicine to help us. I'm not against medicine. I don't want anybody to hear that. I am not against medicine. But I'm saying that our first thing should be, while we're taking the aspirin is, God, help my headache to go away. We're praying as we're using the God-given means that he's given us. But this is a case where he says Satan has kept her bound for 18 years. That's very interesting. What are, what are we to do when worry comes rushing in in our mind? In on our mind. Worry comes rushing in on our mind. And, and Jesus gives kind of an idea here. He says in verse 26, look at that with me in your Bibles. He says, look at the birds of the air. I'm a bird watcher. We're supposed to, the, 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 the idea is to fix your eyes on something. Jesus is saying, fix your eyes on the birds. Fasten your eyes on the birds. Why? Because God wants to teach a teach us a lesson through the birds. Look at this. Look at the birds of the air. Fasten your eyes on the birds. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? He goes from the lesser to the greater. I mean, if God cares for birds, how much more does he care for you? So he's showing us this lesson. Now, God is not the God of the birds. He doesn't say that. Jesus is saying, look at the birds. Does not your heavenly Father take care of you. He's, he's not their father. He's their creator. He's the bird's creator. But God is our father. God's not the father of the birds. God's the father of people. And he says, your father. So he's saying, look at the birds. Take a lesson from the birds. Look at how God takes care of even small little birds. They don't store away in barns. Have you ever seen a bird standing on its perch and it kind of just brings one claw up and put his beak in and go, oh, I'm never going to make it. They don't worry. <laughs> They, they don't get stressed. They don't just shake with nervousness. But birds don't just sit there either. Birds look for the food that God has for them. Birds just don't sit there unless they're a baby like these and just hold their mouth open. Birds have to go out. They have to work to get the food that God has prepared. We can worry, 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 but God gives us something to do. Go work. God gave you a back. God gave you arms. God gave you legs. God gave you a mind. There are 9.1 million job openings in America right now. I can't find a job. There are 9.1 million jobs in America right now. I can't find a job. Well, open your eyes. They're all around. God has given us work to do so that we can earn money, so we can pay our bills, so we can get some food, so that we say, well, I did all that. No, God gave you a strong back and a strong mind, and God gave you the resources to go get it. The, the bird doesn't just sit there. The bird has to actually flap his wings, go and look for food. They're working all the time but God provides for their needs. Learn from that. We do what we can do, and we leave the rest to God. We don't worry about that. We do our part, and we let God take care of the rest. Martin Luther said, God is making the birds our schoolmasters and teachers. A helpless bird becomes a theologian and a preacher. Hmm. <laughs> the same word, anxiety or worry, is used in Luke 10. Martha and Mary in the house, and Martha's rushing around. And she's like, Jesus, come on, get Mary. She's not helping with the cooking. She's not helping with the cleaning. She's not helping with the setup. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better and will not be taken away from her. Same word used there. It's, it's used again here in Matthew. Jesus is talking about the four seeds and the four soils, how the seed goes out on the four soils. Jesus said, the one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. That word worries, it, 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 in the Greek it means strangled, cut the air off, can't breathe. That's what worry is. Vergen is the German word. Worry. Said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so. <laughs> said the sparrow to the robin, friend, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. Hmm. We can learn from the birds, can't we? We can learn something from them. Look at nature. Look at nature. 
maybe in the middle of the night, you need to get up out of your bed instead of worrying and just go and turn on a YouTube video of watching birds and just pray as you watch those birds. Just pray and watch those birds and say, God, you're taking care of them. Get your mind off of what's worrying you. Peter says, cast all of your anxiety on him because he cares for you. How much anxiety should we cast on the Lord? All of our anxiety. We just keep casting it. Then it comes back. It's like a boomerang of anxiety. We cast it again. It comes back. We cast it again. Lord, I'm trying to follow your word. I don't want to worry about this anymore, but it keeps returning to my little pea brain. What's going on? Lord, I'm giving it to you again. I'm giving it to you again. Lord, I'm going to focus on you and begin to recite scripture. Instead of counting sheep, they say, talk to the shepherd. (laughs) <laughs> and just talk to him and say, Lord, you've got to help my heart. I can't stop the worry. I can't stop the fluttering in my heart that's going on. You've got to help me with this. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. I looked up the, the richest men in the world this last week. There are, do you know that there are over a thousand billionaires in the world? Billion with a b b b b b Billionaires. Anybody know any names that are billionaires? You ever heard of Jeff Bezos? You ever heard of these, some of these guys? Oh my word, they've got more money they know what to do with. But yet, I looked up Solomon and his wealth of his day. The equivalent, he would have, he would have been a $2.2 trillion dollar, or trillionaire. All the wealth he had, the, the richest man in the world today has maybe about $200 billion. Solomon had 2.2 trillion. A trillion is what? A thousand billions. <laughs> Solomon was richer than all of these guys. And Jesus says, look at Solomon. He wasn't even clothed in splendor like these flowers are that we see out here. This is Capernaum. This is overlooking the Sea of Galilee. This is where Jesus probably delivered the Sermon on the Mount. And you see what's there? I bet birds were perching there. I bet there are flowers all around there. And he just goes, hey, guys, look. See this? Look at this bird. He's just fluttering around. God's taking care of him. Oh, look at this flower here. Nobody's tending this flower, but look at this. It's beautiful. It's more beautiful than Solomon in all his splendor. Just look around you. Look around you. Just some pictures there. I I think that's beautiful. Just look at those flowers that growing wildly. Wow. Beautiful picture there. This is Longwood's Garden, Pennsylvania. I just thought that was a beautiful picture. Now, somebody planted those, but I, I think just looking at those things can kind of take your mind off of stress. How about this picture here? This is Carlsbad, California. Some of you have been there, I know. Look at those beautiful... I'm just trying to make us meditate on what Jesus says to meditate upon. Look at the flowers of the field. There's another one. Beautiful picture there. I'm not sure where that one was, nor this one. I thought those flowers... Just look at the delicate nature of those flowers. Why does Jesus tell us to look at the flowers of the field? Again, he's arguing from the lesser to the greater. If God cares for these that are here today and gone tomorrow, how much more will he care for you? Isn't that relaxing just to think about Jesus loving us that way? Matthew Henry, he was a Presbyterian minister and a Bible commentary. He was robbed. He was robbed. He was, he, he was robbed right in the street. And here's what he said after being mugged. He didn't fret. He didn't stress. Here's what he said. He lived 1662 to 1714. Matthew Henry said this. <laughs> he said, let me be thankful first because I was never robbed before. Second, because although they took my purse, they did not take my life. Third, because although they took my all, it was not much. And fourth, because it was I who was robbed, not I who robbed. What a perspective. My goodness. Perspective is everything. When you're stressed and worried, 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 get some perspective, Lord. I don't have it as bad as you know who. Oh, Lord, I'm glad I don't live there. I'm glad I don't live in this third world country with no water. Lord, you've given me so much. Begin to count your blessings. Name them one by one. Think about what God has done for you. If that doesn't work, keep doing it. If you don't feel any better, keep doing it. I'm not saying the feeling is going to come immediately. I'm just going to say keep obeying God. Keep trusting the Spirit even in anxious moments. Cast them on the Lord. Cast them on the Lord. They're still here. Cast them some more. Cast all of your anxiety until you get to the bottom of the anxiety barrel. Keep casting those anxieties on the Lord. But pastor, you don't understand. I have so many worries. No, I get it. We all have, we have these worries that come at us. But the Bible says to cast them. I don't feel any better. Keep casting. 
Keep casting all of those worries, those anxieties on the Lord. Let him speak to your heart. Cast your cares or anxieties is another word on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. How about this one? We read this a little bit earlier. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Who guards our minds? It's the peace of God that guards our mind. When we fix our mind on Jesus, and the worries are still trying to penetrate. Nope, Lord, I'm focusing on you. They're still coming at me. I can't get through it. It's dark. It's, it's late. I'm tired. Lord, I'm focusing on you. You may think I sound like a crazy man. I'm just announcing out loud what, you, what happens to you at night as well. We have these thoughts that come our way and we must cast them on the Lord. Every time they come, Lord, it's yours again. Lord, my kids, they're doing this. Oh God, help them. Okay, thanks for helping them. Boom, it comes right back. Oh God, help my kids. And begin to focus on the Lord through that. And it's not pretty. It's messy. I wish my, my life looked better. I wish my Christian life looked better. It doesn't. My Christian life looks really messy at times, and I don't get it perfect, and I mess up, and I slip, and I fall, and I have to say, oh, God, help me. But, but what I want to do is I want to keep getting up. The Bible says, though, a wise man fall six, seven times each time he rises. We get back up. Lord, I worried. You're not mad at me, God. You want to help me. Lord, I'm casting this on you. Here's three realities from the Scripture. God's children are not promised freedom from work, nor from responsibility, nor from trouble, but only from worry. You must work. You must be responsible. And you will have trouble in this life. Thank you, Jesus. He said that. He said, in this life, you will have trouble. We're going to have trouble. Sorry, that's a fact. We live in a world, a fallen world. We will have trouble. But God is with us, and he's promised us to be free from worry. We put our mind on him. Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. What do you do? You just keep seeking God first. I know it's not like a broken record, but I need to hear that. I need to have Scripture washing over me when my mind is the darkest, when I'm feeling the most upset or worried or anxious about something. I've got to turn it over to God, playing Scripture. And I don't really want to hear Scripture in the middle of the night. I really don't. I'm, you say, You're a pastor. I'm just being honest. I want to go to sleep. But I, sometimes I have to just get out of bed and go and listen to Scripture and allow Scripture to calm my racing mind and heart. And maybe you need to do that as well. Maybe God's giving us some help today. Maybe God's showing us that even though it's messy, he will be with us and he will help us. The Bible says mourn with those who mourn. I, I think sometimes if somebody's really down, they're really anxious about something, it's, getting, it's eating at their health, the best thing I can do is just to go and listen to them because usually when I'm, in those places, words aren't affecting me, but love does. God's love affects me somehow. But sometimes maybe it's just sitting with, a, with another fellow who's going through something and just listen and ask questions carefully and with care. It's, it's a lady sitting with another lady and saying, tell me what's going on. And you just listen. And you don't give any, any great advice or any great ideas at first. You just, you just listen. The Bible says to mourn with those who mourn. Feel what they're going through and identify with them. That's the most Christian thing we can do. It's just love. Don't throw platitudes. Don't even, at first, maybe it's not even Scripture. I know that sounds crazy, but I'm saying just listen with Jesus in you. And just listen for a while and let the Spirit speak to your heart first. And then maybe a time will come when you give a Scripture. But maybe it's going to be a hug. The Scripture will be hug. <laughs> love your brother. Love your sister. It's not through words only, it's through actions. When I put my arms around and I hug somebody, that's the love of Christ coming through me to them. Maybe that's what you need to do. I know you're worried, come here. I know you're anxious, come here. I just want to hug you and just be present in that moment with them. I think Jesus probably did that with people that he's talking to. He, he could probably just touch their forehead and boop, all the anxious, anxiety's gone. But I think there are times that Jesus just came alongside people and loved them. He healed them, yes, but I think he, he just loved people in a very real way. I think he touched people. I think he, he hugged people. I think he, he listened to people. Do you listen to people when they're down? That's a great thing to do. I want to give you this. This is some lyrics. You may have heard this before. It's a song by Zach Williams. Fear, he is a liar. He will take your breath, stop you in your steps. Fear, he is a liar. He will rob your rest steal your happiness, 
Cast your fear in the fire, because fear, he is a liar. You may have to play that song, put it on a, on, a, on a playlist, and play that in the times when you're most worried or anxious. No, I'm not going to let this rob me. I'm going to follow after God. Isaiah 53.3, talking about Jesus, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. You are not alone when you feel down. That's depression. That's concern. You may feel down. You may feel down. You're not alone. Jesus was a man who was acquainted with sorrows and grief. He knows what it feels like to be down. You're not a bad Christian because you feel down. You're not a bad person because you feel down or anxious. You're commanded to come and bring that to him. Can we do that? Can we do that? We can, can't we? Do not worry. What's the, what's, what's, what's the solution Jesus gives us? Look at the birds. <laughs> Look at the flowers. Take some time and just say, oh, God, you know my anxious heart. I'm giving it to you. It must be possible for us to be anxious because he says, do not be anxious. We give it to God. Amen. Amen.